You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and on this edition, we're going to be looking ahead to the Friday night football at Emirates Stadium. Aston Villa are the visitors as the Gunners look to put right what happened on Monday night. Arsenal, of course, in the eyes of a lot of us, dropping a couple of points against Patrick Vieira's Crystal Palace. Although, given the way we came back and and found an equaliser deep in stoppage time, I understand why people are trying to put a positive spin on it. I did too. But there's no getting away from the fact that going into these two fixtures with Crystal Palace and Aston Villa, if Arsenal have serious aspirations of getting back into those European places, finishing in the top six this season, we need to be winning games like that. We need to be taking six points from uh, those two fixtures. We can't do that now. It's done. There's no point in crying over spilt milk. But what we can do is make sure that we get as close to that six points as possible. And that means taking three against Aston Villa this Friday night. On this show, we're going to be discussing the team I would like to see Mikel Arteta select. We'll also be picking out a couple of bits from his pre-match press conference. Um, And I'll be wrapping it up with a prediction. This is not a live show, so please feel free to let us know your thoughts on the show, on the team I pick, on my prediction, and of course, your own predictions in the comments section below. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, But just because of time constraints, I'm having to pre-record this episode for our YouTube viewers. I know those of you that listen on the audio platforms are used to this format, but we do have a lot of interaction via YouTube. So I do apologize that on this particular occasion, I'm not able to stream this episode live. Right. So let's take a few of the key points from Mikel Arteta's press conference. He sat down and faced the media on Thursday afternoon and he discussed a few interesting bits. Now, he talked about the fact that off the back of that Crystal Palace draw, there are a few players carrying knocks. He refused to say exactly how many. He kind of hinted it was a few, two or three, I think is what was probably uh, picked up on by the uh, the people that were in attendance of the press conference and those that were watching it on television, etc., etc. Seems like there's two or three players who have got injury issues going into this game. Now, we know that one of them is Bukayo Saka, and we know that because Mikel Arteta confirmed that the England international is yet to train since sustaining that injury after James MacArthur's foul. He also went on to talk about the fact that Arsenal, after the question was asked, of course, were really or really felt hard done by by the fact that James MacArthur wasn't sent off. It's since come to light, according to the Mirror, I know it's not the most reliable of sources, that Mike Dean was told by the VAR to have a look at it, to go and have a look at it. And he refused. And as a consequence of that, Mike Dean has been dropped from the Premier League roster this weekend. Now, here's what I would say about Mike Dean, Okay, There isn't an official in the world that doesn't make mistakes. There isn't an official in the world who at one point or another was convinced they saw one thing and then watched it back on TV and went, oops, that's not what. That's not what I saw. That's not what I thought I saw. I got this wrong. I don't have an issue with referees on the odd occasion making mistakes. That is why VAR is in place. But if you as a referee are arrogant enough to say to the VAR, no, you're wrong, despite you having better sight of it, despite you having multiple replays, and despite you having the time to look into the incident, then that for me is unforgivable. As a referee, at the very minimum, you should be going over and looking at your screen. Now, some fans have you know, made a case that says that when the referee is sent over to the screen, more often than not, they then change their original decision. And that's where the referees have to be strong. That's where the referees have to be fair and you know, understanding that they don't have eight pairs of eyes and that there are going to be times where they miss stuff. Go over, eat your bit of humble pie, admit you got it wrong and make the correct decision. I'd have a lot more respect for a referee if they were more open to doing that. And unfortunately, in the Premier League, probably more than anywhere else in the world, we've got a real issue with that. 
Mike Dean, as I said, dropped this week and will not be refereeing a Premier League game, according to the Mirror. And that just says to you, doesn't it, that, you know, he's he's obviously got something wrong and the, the, the authorities, the PGMOL, don't feel that that was acceptable. The big problem is, though, is that this has been happening for ages. Mike Dean, in particular, is a referee who's always in the headlines for the wrong reasons. So why do we continue to persist with him? Why does he continue to get games? Why does he continue to referee at the highest level when it's clear he's not up to the job? Moving on, um, Mikel Arteta talked quite a bit, actually, about Alexander Lacazette and his future. Now, there's been strong calls for Alexander Lacazette to come back into the starting lineup ahead of this one after an impressive display against Crystal Palace from the substitutes bench. Alexander Lacazette made the difference for the Gunners, or at least earned them a point in the end with his late stoppage time goal. But now there is a debate around whether he should come in and if so, who should he replace? Now, we put a poll out yesterday. Oh, I put a poll out on my personal Twitter page. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head, there was around about 83% of you that wanted to see Alexander Lacazette starting the game. The big question is, though, who should drop out of the team? Now, my suggestion was that... Actually, I'm not going to tell you my suggestion because it will spoil me revealing my lineup. But you know what I mean? Uh, I, I do have a suggestion, which you might have heard on a previous episode, but we'll make sure uh, that I'm saving it for those of you who missed that, at least. Uh, and we'll go on to that in the lineups. But aside from the talk about Lacazette starting and, and Mikel Arteta being asked outright if he was going to start, which, of course, in true Mikel Arteta fashion, he refused to answer. There's been a lot of talk about his future and what it means um, to us that of course, Alexander Lacazette will be free in January to speak to overseas clubs about his future. His contract ends at the end of the season. There was nothing done about it in the summer. But what you have to give Alexander Lacazette immense credit for is that it doesn't seem to be affecting him in any way. Is it affecting the manager, though? Is it affecting Mikel Arteta in terms of his reluctance to start him? Is he reluctant to start him because of that situation and he just won't admit it? I don't really know. Um, you know, it's been a difficult one in the last couple of weeks because I do think uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang has really put a shift in. And as a result of that, I'm not sure it's so easy to just shift him out of his preferred position and put Lacazette back in. But Lacazette's attitude has been exemplary. We know that he's a big influence on the young players around him. We know he's a big influence on the pitch. We saw that on Monday night. We also saw him geeing up the crowd. And you might not have seen that if uh, you were watching the game on TV. I don't know if they the cameras caught that particular part. But Alexander Lacazette, at one point when Arsenal had won a corner, came over to the North Bank and was really giving it, you know, to, to get people up off their feet, to get people cheering behind the team. And of course, the scenes when the ball ended up in the back of the net um, after he finished it were obviously, uh, you know, very good, very strong, very positive. I know a lot of Arsenal fans have taken issue with that, uh, issue with people celebrating a goal. You know, look, it wasn't a Champions League winning goal and it was a goal that spared us embarrassment more than anything else. But it was a goal that meant we remained unbeaten. And the day you stop celebrating 93rd, 94th minute equalisers. Football's dead. What's the point? Um, so I don't really have an issue with with the fact that there was quite strong celebrations off the back of that. But it's just, you know, you, you see that passion and that fire in Alexander Lacazette. And for me, you cannot question his commitment to the cause, which is why Mikel Arteta alluded to in his press conference that he was quite happy for, for Alexander Lacazette to remain at the club despite this situation ongoing, despite the fact that no talks are currently taking place over his future. Had it been someone with a different attitude, I'm sure, as Mikel Arteta again alluded to, there would have been a different action taken around Lacazette in the summer. He also talked uh, a little bit about going back to that whole Mike Dean thing that Arsenal had had communication with the PGMOL, wanting a, I guess, a explanation as to why that decision was was not taken by Mike Dean and he didn't listen to the advice of the VAR. Um, but, you know, he was, he called it unacceptable and I think he was absolutely spot on. He also, interestingly, leapt to the defence of fired Newcastle boss Steve Bruce, who's been in the news a lot lately. He's talked a lot about the treatment he's received from the Newcastle fan base, about the personal abuse that's come his way. And look, I talk about this quite a bit on this podcast because, 
look, I'm nowhere near as high profile as a Premier League manager and I never, ever will be. But anybody who puts themselves in the public domain in their work, I think, deserves a basic respect. Because a lot of the time, half the people that are sitting there calling you every name under the sun wouldn't have the balls to do what you do, wouldn't have the expertise to do what you do, and wouldn't have the kind of... Um, as to put it in Troy Deeney terms, the cojones to put their opinions and their views out in the public domain week after week after week, knowing that whatever way, whatever side of the fence they sit, they will receive backlash. So one thing I'm really big on is you might not like Steve Bruce as a manager. I didn't like Unai Emery as a manager. You know, you, you will have those opinions and those opinions are absolutely fine. But the way in which you put those opinions across and the way in which some people choose to personally abuse these people, it does have an effect. It does take its toll. And essentially, a manager or a person in Steve Bruce who's been in the game for 40 plus years has managed a thousand Premier League games, as Mikel Arteta so articulately pointed out during the press conference, has been run out of the game, basically, because he's talking now, Steve Bruce, about that potentially being his last job. He talked about the toll it takes on his family. And I think Mikel summed it up brilliantly when he said that there is a responsibility to everyone uh, or for everyone to make sure that this stuff improves because it's simply not on. We've created this reactionary culture. In a lot of ways, it's not just in football, it's in politics, it's in world affairs. It's in every walk of life, it seems at the moment, but there is this really reactionary uh, kind of attitude towards things and this willingness to to abuse people without any thought for the consequences, without any consideration for what it is you're actually saying or doing. And to me, it's just not on. So sad to see those comments from Steve Bruce, sad to see that he feels as though this might be his last job after, I think it was 40 consecutive seasons in the game. And that's an incredible achievement. Not the greatest manager in the world. Look, I'll be honest, I, I don't particularly rate Steve Bruce, but I do think some of the personal abuse that's been directed in his way is um, is unacceptable. I don't want to sit here and pretend that it's only Newcastle fans that do that or, you know, say that they are they are, you know, a disgrace because there are large sections of our fan fan base that would do the same thing, that in fact do the same thing, whether that have been to Arsene Wenger in the past, to Unai Emery at certain points, to Mikel Arteta now, to individual players. It's a, a society problem, not a problem exclusive to Newcastle Football Club or football for that matter. So it's something that needs to improve, something that we need to work hard on and something that I think there should be greater consequences for as a deterrent to those people who feel that they can do that from behind the keyboard somewhere in the middle of God knows where. So I'm um, glad that Mikel spoke about that, glad that he you know talked about the power of what Steve Bruce had to say and and that he recognises there is a need for some improvement in that sense. Right, let's move on then. Let's talk a little bit more in detail about this Friday night's game. First of all, I just want to point out, I think it's ridiculous that Arsenal have to play on a Monday and then on a Friday in the Premier League. The whole point of not having European football was that or I guess the, the positive of not having European football as it was sold to us was that we would get the opportunity um, you know, to have a great arrest between games. And that's not been the case this time around. In fact, Aston Villa have had 48 hours more to prepare for this game uh, than we have. So obviously that's disappointing. Mikel Arteta refused to kind of concede that that was an advantage for Aston Villa, but I certainly think it is one. And the fact that we've got players who haven't trained yet in Bukayo Saka, um, you know, you never know if the game was on Sunday, he might've got a couple of training sessions under his belt going into this one, and that might have made a difference. You know, it, it just seems silly for me, and it's Friday night football is a mess. I hate it. I can't stand it. I don't like it. I get the idea of it. I get the concept of it. You know, kick off your weekend with a Premier League game, but very few people that I've spoken to actually like Friday night football. I actually quite like Friday night as a night to just chill out and do something else because I know my weekend is going to be packed with whether that be writing about football, talking about football, commentating on football. For me, it's just great to have a night off. And that is my night off. There's no Champions League. There's no Monday night football. There's no Europa League. And they've taken that away from me this week as well. Um, but let's look at the fixture in a little bit more detail. Of course, the two clubs have met in the Premier League 
on 52 occasions to date. Now, that is a lot. But of course, these are two of uh, the Premier League's uh, mainstays, if that's what you want to call them. Obviously, Aston Villa have been relegated, but they're still uh, a big part of the Premier League's history. Uh, just looking at it, 52 games. Arsenal have won 27 of those. Aston Villa have won 11. So Arsenal very dominant on that front. We've won 15 of them at home. Uh, Aston Villa have only won six away. So history dictates that Arsenal should be uh, the favourites here. But of course, things have changed and shifted a lot in the last couple of seasons. There's also been 14 draws between the two clubs. Cast your mind back to last season and Aston Villa did the double over us. A 1-0 win at Villa Park in February. And then, of course, they beat us at the Emirates uh, during that awful run we had, didn't they? On Sunday, the 8th of November, by three goals to nil. Going back to the season prior, Aston Villa beat us at Villa Park. We won at the Emirates by three goals to two. But, um, you know, it's it's been a difficult fixture for us in recent times. Aston Villa have won three of the last four in the Premier League. So uh, certainly they'll be feeling pretty confident going into this one. Now, in terms of current league position, not much separates the two sides at this moment in time. Arsenal sit in 12th, Aston Villa sit in 13th. Both sides have won three games. Arsenal have drawn two, Villa have drawn one. Arsenal have only lost three in comparison to Villa's four. Average goal score per match, Aston Villa completely dominate us in this statistic. They've scored one and a half goals per match in comparison to Arsenal's 0.88. Not even a goal a game for Arsenal on average this season. And that is, of course, a concern. In terms of average goals conceded, we're on exactly the same. One and a half goals conceded per match on average. Three clean sheets apiece. Aston Villa creating notably more chances than Arsenal with 0.88 per game in comparison to our 0.63. Looking at top player stats, well, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and Danny Ings are tied at the top for Premier League goals with three apiece. Uh, in terms of assists, there's not a single Arsenal player in that top three. Danny Ings and Douglas Luiz lead the way there with two apiece. And Leon Bailey comes in at third. When it comes to passes, Tyrone Mings is uh, leading the way. 363 passes in the Premier League. Benjamin White on 299 and Albert Sambi Laconga sits on 283. And in terms of tackles, Matty Cash and John McGinn lead in that department. So, yeah, uh, mixed bag in terms of the statistics. I mean, for me, people talk a lot about Villa in a positive light lately. And I, and I think they have made some good moves in the transfer market. I think they've done some really good stuff. But um, they've been underwhelming at the start of this campaign as well. You know, there's no doubt about that. People were talking about them overtaking us in the summer, talking about some of the signings they've made and how that elevates them up to this higher level. It's not going to be an easy game because I feel these are two sides that are around about the similar level and it could go either way for sure. But are Aston Villa as great as, as people have made them out to be? I'm not so sure. Having said that, we haven't been either. You know, and that's why for me, this is going to be an incredibly tight fixture. I'll give you my prediction just after I reveal my lineup. So let's do that first of all. And let me just share the screen with you for those of you watching us on YouTube to provide you with a bit of a visual representation of what it is I would like to see Mikel Arteta do this Friday. Um, right. So for me, the back line is really easy. OK, there's no need to discuss this. There's no need to get uh, really deep into it. I think we can all agree that we've benefited from having a settled backline in recent weeks. Now, we don't know if any of the players in that backline are players that are carrying a knock. Mikel Arteta, as I mentioned, didn't want to reveal who those players were. We know that one of them is Bukayo Saka, but who are the other two? Not so sure. So my backline is Aaron Ramsdale in goal and the back four of Takahiro Tomiyasu, Ben White, Gabriel and Kieran Tierney. Moving into midfield, I don't want to see anything other than the 4-2-3-1. I've maintained throughout the season that for me, that is the shape and system and formation that gives Arsenal the most balance. Therefore, I don't want to see the 4-3-3. I don't want to see the 4-1-4-1. None of that. 4-2-3-1. We're without one of our key central midfield players in Granit Xhaka. And therefore, we need as much stability as we can get. Did Albert Sambi Lekonga necessarily cover himself in glory when he came on 
uh, against Crystal Palace midweek. I think it was the right move to bring on a player of that ilk to play alongside Thomas Partey. We were clearly being overrun in the first period, but I would argue that Lakonga wasn't very good. His uh, giveaway or, or individual error, whatever you want to call it, is what led to Crystal Palace's second goal. And I'm a little bit worried that we're putting him in an environment that he's going to fail in. And therefore, we're in danger of, of ruining him a little bit. Uh, ruining, ruining him a little bit, sorry. Um, and, and maybe damaging his confidence and, and really causing him problems. But on the other side, the flip side to that is, well... It's valuable experience for Albert Sambi Lekonga. And I think that the valuable experience thing, when you're talking about Project Youth, which is obviously the route that Arsenal have decided to go down, probably outweighs the risk of the damage it does to him. If he's strong mentally enough, if he's got people, the right people around him, the right coaching around him, I think he can handle the inevitable kind of downs that come with the ups and I think he'll be okay. So um, I'm going to go with Lekonga in the midfield alongside Thomas Partey. The alternative was maybe to bring Mohamed Elneny in, maybe to bring Ainsley Maitland-Niles in. But for me, neither of those are convincing enough to, to stand in the way of Lekonga's development for me personally. Then the question comes a little bit further forward. And for me, I think that it's time to take Martin Odegaard out of the side, if only momentarily, because I think he's been really poor in the last couple of games. I think people are starting to get on his back. It's not really working for him. And as a result, I would play Emil Smith-Rowe in the number 10 position. I think that Odegaard needs to be taken out of the firing line. I think we can quite easily forget just how young he is and how much he's still developing and finding himself as well. And, and as a result, the pressure that we put on him is you know, is is greater than it should be. The weight of expectation on his shoulders is probably weighing him down a little bit. And so I think that after a couple of really disappointing performances, albeit at times playing in a role that I don't think necessarily suits him, I think he's he's not been great and he should come out of the side. Now, in the wide positions, this is where it gets interesting for me because we know that Bakayo Saka is doubtful. So I wouldn't take any risk with Bakayo Saka. I don't think he's been that great lately anyway, aside from the first 45 minutes in the North London derby. I think he's had a slow start to the season. I think a lot of the players that played for England at the Euros are suffering a similar issue. And I think actually a bit of time on the sidelines might do Bukayo Saka some good. Nicolas Pepe plays from the right for me. And a lot of people were critical of Nicolas Pepe showing uh, on Monday night. And, and often we look at Nicolas Pepe and we find him frustrating and we look at some of the things he does and, and some of the way in which our attacks break down uh, with him at the kind of forefront of things. But I always say this about Nicolas Pepe. I think he's always a threat. I think when you look at how our goal came about uh, against Crystal Palace, the opening goal that is, he did cut inside, forced a save out of Guaita. Fortunately for us, the ball fell to Aubameyang. But Pepe's always willing to put himself in those positions and try things that are sometimes a little bit outside of the box. He's not a safe player in terms of he won't just receive the ball cut inside and roll it square every single time. He will try and take on a man. He will try a trick. He will try a flick. And if he finds the opportunity, he will have a pop shot. And sometimes you need that. Sometimes I think that's undervalued, the kind of confidence that somebody like Nicolas Pepe has to try those things. You know, often that can be a difference maker. There'll be times where it doesn't work and he'll have off nights. And we know he's not at that elite level whereby he's going to perform consistently every single week. But for me, I'd rather have him on the pitch than not on the pitch because I just think he gives us um, that unpredictability and that X factor at times when it does come off for him that very few of our other wide forwards seem to be able to produce or find anywhere near frequently enough. So Nicolas Pepe plays for me. Alexander Lacazette does play up front for me. Um, I think he's deserved it. I think if Arteta was to leave him out after the impact he's had coming off the bench in the last couple of weeks, I think there would be a lot to answer for, or I think the Spaniard would have a lot to answer for. So Lacazette would lead the line for me, but that does not mean that I'm dropping Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. I think he has been uh, really committed in the last few weeks. I think he's worked incredibly hard, and I think that the combination play between him and Lacazette, which we saw 
for a short spell at the end of the Crystal Palace game could be key in breaking this Aston Villa side down. I think the fact that he will drift infield and join Lacazette will give Villa centre-halves a different problem to worry about. It also creates the space for Kieran Tierney to bomb on on the outside and hopefully he'll have two targets to pick out in the box if Aubameyang can make those sort of runs. I do think, though, if we're going to play with Aubameyang from the left, it's even more imperative that we play with that two-man pivot in midfield rather than just the one. Somebody needs to be there to cover the fact that Tierney will bomb on and that Aubameyang is not going to work back the way that Bukayo Saka normally does. So I think that's probably the team I would go with. I think, as I say, with Saka, doubtful. We know that there's a couple of other doubts, but we don't know who they are. So it's difficult for me to incorporate that into my team selection. But just looking at that, I think that looks about right to me. I wouldn't be surprised if Elneny came into the midfield alongside Thomas Partey instead of Lokonga, just because of his greater experience and he probably brings you a little bit more stability defensively but that's what I would go with so just to run through that one more time Ramsdale in goal Tommy Asu at right back Ben White Gabriel and Tierney uh, across the rest of the defense Lokonga and Partey in midfield Emil Smith Rowe at 10 Pepe on the right Aubameyang on the left and Alexander Lacazette my prediction is going to be a 1-0 to the Arsenal. I keep predicting that lately uh, and I'm hoping it will come off at some point. It did come off a few weeks back, but we've had a couple of disappointments uh, off the back of that. Disappointment at Brighton, disappointment, of course, against Crystal Palace. But I'm going to stick with the 1-0 to the Arsenal, the pragmatic Arsenal, hoping to get over the line, at least in my mind anyway. Uh, so that's what I'm going with. Don't forget to leave your predictions in the comments. Hit the like button if you haven't done so already. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're creeping ever closer to that 17K mark here on YouTube. If you're listening via the audio, leave us a review. We'll be back very, very soon with some more Arsenal content. Until then, take care. Goodbye. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.